Episode 1, Harris's List of Covent Garden Ladies. Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of Amorous Histories. I'm Annie Harrison, thank you for joining me and thank you to everyone who supported me so far with social media follows, likes and shares. Hopefully you'll like what you hear and keep spreading the word. And if you haven't already found my social media pages, I am at Amorous Histories on Instagram and Facebook and at Amorous Hist Pod on Twitter. I also set up a website which is Amorous Histories Podcast dot WordPress dot com. Today we're going to be talking about Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies and I have to start off by saying that If after listening to this podcast you want to learn more, go and find one of Hallie Rubenhold's books on the topic because they're fab and her research has contributed a lot to the subject. I'll put my source list in the show notes, which will be on the website, so you can get the details of her work if you so wish. I'll also link to an essay I wrote on Harris's list during my MA in 18th century studies at the Centre for 18th century studies in York University. I basically just debate whether or not Harris's list should be considered a piece of pornography over a catalogue. So feel free to give it a read and tell me what you think. Please be aware that although there's nothing sexually explicit in this episode, it does get pretty heavy with innuendo at points. Right, let's get to it. Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies was an annual directory published from 1757 to 1795, listing the prostitutes available in London's Covent Garden area. If you've watched the TV series Harlots, you will have seen the best reference in the very first episode where one of the characters reads the entries for the women in her brothel. I remember when I first saw that, I squealed with nerdy excitement. The list took the form of a catalogue detailing the names, prices and physical descriptions of the women, as well as where they could be found and any so-called special talents they possessed. Although the list was published under Jack Harris's name, the real and celebrated Covent Garden pimp never actually authored the work. Originally, the guidebook was written anonymously in 1757 by Irish poet Samuel Derrick in an act of desperation, a money-making scheme to ensure he avoided fleet debtors' prison. This publication has proved such a success that he continued to compile it every year until his death in 1769. Copies of the small 6 by 4 inch list were sold for two shillings and sixpence each, and originally they could be obtained in Covent Garden from the Shakespeare's Head Tavern or the neighbouring brothel of Mother Jane Douglas. As Harris's list became more popular, it also became much more widely available. It could be purchased on Fleet Street, from the kiosk at Covent Garden Piazza, and from many of the brothels that line the streets of Covent Garden and that area of London. The conception of Harris's list does not suggest that Derek had a particularly savvy business mind, nor that he was eager to write about the debauchery that surrounded him. Instead, to me, it suggests that he needed to increase his finances quickly. In 1751, Derek quit Dublin and a career as a linen merchant and moved to London in the hope of becoming a successful poet. He spent his time in Covent Garden frequenting establishments such as the Shakespeare's Head and Bedford Coffee House, soaking up both the atmosphere and the alcohol. Derek had expected to collect subscriptions from wealthy patrons in order to fund the publication of his poetry. However, his campaign was unsuccessful and he was left empty-handed with only one published poem to his name. By 1752, his savings had significantly depleted, so Derek turned to London's Greb Street and took a job as a hack writer while still chasing subscriptions. Derek continually made poor economic choices throughout his life and never really learnt from his previous mistakes. Eventually, despite the kindness and generosity of his friends, in 1757, Derek's taste for drinking, prostitutes and fine clothes had landed him in Ferguson's sponging house, awaiting transfer to Fleet Street debtors' prison. It was this dire situation that led Derek to first write Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies in a desperate attempt to escape prison and pay back his creditors. Now, you may be thinking, if Samuel Derrick authored the list, why isn't it called Derrick's List of Covent Garden Ladies? Enter Jack Harris, also known as John Harrison. And yes, I do really hope we're related. 
He was a famed pimp and waiter at the Shakespeare's Head in Covent Garden. The Shakespeare's Head catered to all crowds, from destitute hacks like Samuel Derrick to aristocrats like Beau Tracy, all in search of alcoholic refreshment and some intimate company. Harris plied his trade as a pimp whilst working in the Shakespeare's Head, connecting men in need of servicing with one of the many prostitutes working around Covent Garden. In order to work effectively as a pimp, Harris kept a list of all the women he could call on to pleasure a paying customer. It was common during the 18th century for pimps to carry with them a list of the prostitutes on their books. However, Harris compiled a list that through its sheer volume surpassed all others. Harris's list was full of intimate details. It had the names of the women, their most current addresses and where they might be found in London, their ages, their prices, descriptions of their physical characteristics, biographical details, comments about their health and, of course, their specialised services. One contemporary account of Jack Harris's list comes from a 1759 second edition of Memoirs of Celebrated Miss Fanny Murray, the life story of the famous 18th century London courtesan. Although not written by Murray herself, and therefore containing false stories for the reader's pleasure, this whole biography does give us an interesting insight into the knowledge of Harris's personal list and Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies at the time. Hall biographies are a whole other subject, which hopefully I'll be able to do an episode on at some point. Anyway, the author claims that Jack Harris wished to have Miss Fanny Murray enrolled upon his parchment list, so a surgeon performed a complete examination of her person to report her well or ill, making sure she was free of venereal disease. A lawyer was present to engross her name, and after having signed a written agreement to forfeit £20, if she gave Harris wrong information about her health, her name with a short description and her address was added to Harris's list of prostitutes. Samuel Derrick would have come across Harris's list of some 400 women whilst drinking at the Shakespeare's head. Many of Derrick's female acquaintances and lovers would have been among Harris's extensive hall club. Although Jack Harris played no part in writing Harris's list, it was probably his notorious name that helped to sell it. Each copy of the list carried the signature of Jack Harris, which was actually written by Samuel Derrick, on the title page to prove authenticity. Interestingly, Halley Rubenhold suggests that the publication of the list may have initially been Harris's idea, saying, Whose idea precisely it was to lay the work in print shall never be known. Either the entrepreneurial Harris may have planted the seed in the author's mind, or Sam, after spying the ordered entries of the pimp's personal catalogue, became fascinated by its contents. In my opinion, given the nature of Harris's list, it's more likely that Derek conceived the idea himself as a genuinely extensive directory of prostitutes being made available to the general public would have undermined Harris in his work as so-called Pimp General of All England and removed him from the lucrative middleman position. Harris would have received a one-off payment from Derek for the use of his name in the title. However, neither the hack or the pimp could have predicted the success of the list or the financial gain that accompanied it. Harris would not have received any further payment from the annual publications, which perhaps explains why, in 1766, he wrote and printed his own version of the list, calling it Kitty's Atalantis. Like Harris's list, Kitty's Atalantis was full of the names, addresses and descriptions of the London prostitutes, from elite courtesans to streetwalkers. Due to Harris's shortage of literary flair, Kitty's Atalantis lacked the pornographic language and titillating storytelling Derek and his successors had made the core of Harris's list. Consequently, Kitty's Atalantis sold poorly and Harris decided against a second run. In a century obsessed by sex, it was common for the metropolitan elite to have one or more mistresses in keeping. Now for a bit of context about the sexual landscape of the 18th century. It was common practice for the metropolitan elite to have one or more mistresses in keeping. Doing so became a show of status and wealth that set aristocrats apart from the lower echelons of society. The publishing industry reacted to this explosion of rakish behaviour by creating more and more pornographic material to serve customers of every economic circumstance. Julie Peekman noted that the price of material varied from penny sheets and six penny books to expensive leather bound books costing up to six guineas, the majority of them falling somewhere between one shilling and three shillings. 
Similar stories and poems can be found in chapbooks, magazines and newspaper pamphlets. As well as pornography, directories listing the names, prices and places a prostitute could be found were not uncommon in the 18th century. And the very first such publications can be tracked back to the 16th century. One of the earliest of the 18th century was the London Bells or a description of the most celebrated beauties in the metropolis of Great Britain, printed in 1707. It featured 32 ladies of pleasure. However, the poetic descriptions of each prostitute are quietly suggestive compared to the bold sexual entries found in Harris's list 50 years later. Uh, I'm going to read you an extract of London Bells now. Um, from page 11 about the Lawrence sisters. See now how art and nature both are kind, in two bright sisters intimately joined. The Lawrences their fragrant charms express, while all mankind their influence confess. Darts from their piercing eyes like lightning fly, and scatter wild contagion through the sky. Such lovely features and such charming hair Shining and black as raven's feathers are, are foils invincible that nature does prepare, and by unerring methods, to us shows the choicest beauties in her garden grows. Now, obviously, that's a poem, um, and it lacks the same level of innuendo which we'll see in Harris's list. The entries in Harris's list are vivid accounts of the prostitutes available to purchase within the Covent Garden area. Rather than just recounting the physical details of the women, the author slips into his own fantasy world, describing the women in a plethora of poetical, hyperbolic and metaphoric terms. In the 1787 issue, Mrs B-NN-R of No. 4 Walnut Tree Walk, Lambeth, is described as having an irresistible eye, capable of firing the most torpid imagination with as fierce desire as a torch dipped in the ever-burning flame upon the altar of Venus. Likewise, in the 1773 edition, Betsy B-L-W in Castle Street, Oxford Market, is portrayed as near perfection. The writer describing her skin as polished ivory with firmness and smoothness, which are unparalleled. The writing takes a distinctly more pornographic turn when the author bends his pen to illustrating the women and their fantasy partners' sexual organs. Mrs B-NN-R is described as having a a blissful font hid within the centre of her bewitching grove and her involuntary sighs of excess pleasure solicit the endearing clasp of manly pleasure which the titillation of nature in her favourite spot below feelingly call for the Piparian weapon to receive it in her sheath at its most powerful thrust up to the hilt. Harris's list provides the details of hundreds of supposedly sexually ferocious prostitutes who choose this career because of their love for the sport. The list is selling the men. The fallacy of inexhaustible plentitude of female sexual generosity and attractiveness and casting them as the man these make-believe women desire the most. When in fact the ladies of Covent Garden probably would have received almost any customer able to pay the fee. In a more obvious attempt to arouse readers, the lists offered coy descriptions of the specialised sexual services on offer from the ladies of the Covent Garden. Miss Noble, a fine girl with a lovely fair complexion, has the particular skill of reviving the dead. The author writes that her tongue has a double charm, both when speaking and when silent, for the tip of it, properly applied, can send such feelings to the central spot that immediately demand the more noble weapon to close the melting scene. As these extracts show, the author is less concerned about poetics and sort of literary form rather than creating pornographic images for the reader um, and selling the services of the prostitutes compared to London Bells. Newspaper adverts announcing the publication of a new issue of the list also advertised the back copies that were still available for purchase. For example, 
On the 6th of February 1775, an advert in the public advertiser advises readers that Harris's list has this day been published and was available to buy from H. Ranger, Temple Exchange Passage, Fleet Street, where copies of Harris's list for 1771, 1772, 1773 and 1774 could also be purchased. In my opinion, the only reason someone would buy outdated copies would appear to be so they could use them for their own sexual pleasure. Interestingly, in January 1780, an advert in the Morning Chronicle and London Advertiser lists the available back copies still obtainable as the years 1771, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. The advertisement of an entire decade of back copies certainly implies that there may have been demand for the issues of Harris's list to be almost constantly available. So once an issue the reader was currently consuming had been exhausted, they could move on to the next copy, or perhaps go back to their favourite entries from past years. During her research on the publishing history of Harris's list, Janet Ng Freeman found that in 1781, complete sets from the year 1771 to the present year were offered at one guinea in an advert from the March Morning Herald. The offering of the list as an entire set demonstrates that the writers knew their work was being used as pornography. Otherwise, it's doubtful they would have advertised their availability of back copies so abundantly. After Samuel Derrick's death in 1769, it is unknown who assumed control of the list. But by the late 1780s, the writing roles had been adopted by brothers John and James Roach, along with John Atkin, who were responsible for the book's publication until January 1795. In early 1794, John Roach and John Atkin were convicted of libel for publishing Harris's list. Despite this, James Roach went on to publish one further issue, which ultimately led to his imprisonment for libel a year after his brother. Scholars such as Halle Rubenhold have concluded that after the sentencing of the Roach brothers, production of the list ceased, as by the end of the century, the legal and financial risks to any potential writers or printers were too high. This was due to the crackdown on immoral behaviour championed by supporters of King George III's 1787 Proclamation for the Encouragement of Piety and Virtue and for the Preventing and Punishing of Vice, Profaneness and Immorality. A society of moral performers headed by the Bishop of London and comprising of a great number of gentlemen of the highest rank and estimation were increasing their attempts to find and prosecute those who did not meet their own moral standards. And of course, Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies offended them deeply. Personally, I find Harris's list fascinating. The author is writing about real women who prostituted themselves in 18th century London, but he blends their authentic lives with a fictional hyperbolic narrative to firstly earn himself money, but also to drive customers towards the women. To my knowledge, there aren't any sources that offer the women's opinion on being part of this list, but that may be my memory failing me, so... Let me know if they are out there, because I'd love to read them. So, that was Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies. Like I said earlier, if this has whetted your appetite, pardon the pun, then check out the source list, as well as the digitised copies of the original pamphlets which are available online. There are so many angles you could look at Harris's list from, so I'd consider this just a bit of an introduction, really. Thank you so much for listening. We've made it through my first podcast. Let me know what you think. You can DM me or drop an email to amorousshistories at gmail.com. It will definitely be a learning process, figuring out the best ways to structure my script, edit the recording and do technical stuff like that. But if you're here with me now, you get to watch me grow and fingers crossed get better. Thank you again. I've been your host, Annie Harrison, and this has been the Amorous Histories Podcast.